following the ATR 72-500 crash in Brazil, there are two other ATR crashes that we need to review. I'm Stan, let's get into it. A year and a half ago on January 15th, 2023, a Yeti Airlines ATR 72 crashed while on short final to runway 12 at Pokhara International Airport in Nepal. If you're looking for the face of tragedy, you need not look any further than the Facebook Live video that was streaming by a passenger aboard the flight that recorded the final moments of the 72 occupants. Remarkably, the phone not only survived the impact, but continued to stream the hellish aftermath until the device finally gave in to the post-crash fire. Similar to the recent crash in Brazil, the aircraft was recorded by bystanders on the ground, and the recording suggested that both of these accident aircraft had stalled and entered a spin. An aerodynamic stall occurs when a wing stops producing lift, which is generally the result of operating at too slow of an airspeed. A spin is an out-of-control condition where one wing is producing more lift than the other wing during a stall, resulting in excessive rotational forces that the pilots are unable to counter. We're going to talk about the ATR for a moment because it's a center in a trio of accidents that we're going to be looking at. ATR is a Franco-Italian aircraft manufacturer founded in 1981 with headquarters in Toulouse, Blagnac International Airport in France. As always here, excuse any mispronunciations. Airbus currently maintains a 50% ownership stake in the company. Leonardo makes up the additional 50%. The ATR 42 and 72 dominate the current turboprop market with a 75% market share. Approximately 800 ATR 72s are currently in operation worldwide. Obviously, we have renewed interest in this crash due to the more recent ATR 72 crash in Brazil. There is a third crash that's also relevant, American Eagle Flight 4184. I'm not going to go into great detail about that accident right now. That deserves its own video, and I'll do that soon. But it involved flight in icing conditions, which is strikingly similar to the conditions that Volpass Flight 2283 encountered. The Eagle flight spiraled out of control into the ground as well, although it was more of a traditional spin as opposed to a flat spin. Eagle 4184 hit the ground so hard that recovering the bodies was difficult. Not to be too graphic, but the occupants sort of vaporized in the aftermath. Later, after the NTSB had finished cleaning up the site, family members reportedly found body parts that remained at the site that had been left behind. That obviously compounded a horrible experience for them. In the Nepal crash, the ATR slammed into a ridge and fell into a ravine. 70 bodies were recovered. Ultimately, they couldn't find two of the bodies. There were 72 victims of this particular crash. There's a bit of a common thread that weaves its way through these three accidents. On the Nepal flight, before reaching Manka, the PM, pilot monitoring, expressed intentions to familiarize the PF, pilot flying, on runway 12, even though runway 30 was in use at the time. Runway 30 utilized a much simpler straight-in approach, while the visual to 12 required a sharp turn onto short final due to terrain. The intent seemed to be to validate that the trainee captain could manage the more difficult approach to runway 12, but that familiarization was not a requirement of Yeti Airlines Operations Department. It certainly represented a harsh introduction to the left seat for the trainee captain. Investigators overlaid the teardrop flight path of the two previous Yeti aircraft to land on runway 12. The trainee captain's flight path was nearly identical, so she flew a good approach. But investigators also noted that the aircraft was not stabilized prior to descending below 500 feet above the airport elevation. Now, by stabilized, they mean that engine power was not set to a figure normal for a 700 foot per minute or so rate of descent, with the gear and flaps set for landing and the aircraft centered on the extended runway center line. They also noted that checklists were not followed properly in critical phases of flight. Investigators stated their belief that the crew was most probably distracted due to excessive conversation in the cockpit because the flight was the first for the PF, with the PM more focused on providing instruction than performing his required PM duties 
as an acting first officer. So the likely cause here was a distracted instructor pilot who was acting as a pilot monitoring, whose duties included extending the flaps when directed to do so by the pilot flying. That the instructor pilot inadvertently grabbed the two handles just next to the flap handle, lifted the retaining handles on them, and pulled them aft. ATR states it like this in their marketing materials. The ATR-72 is a market-leading regional aircraft offering seating up to 78 passengers. Celebrated by the airlines and financing community for its unrivaled fuel efficiency and low level of CO2 emissions, it also offers low operating costs to maximize airlines' profitability and accessibility to the most challenging airfields. Featuring state-of-the-art technology with a spacious cabin, the ATR-72 connects people and businesses in a modern, responsible, and reliable way. The ATR-72-600 is a benchmark aircraft in the regional market with unbeatable economics. Operating costs on competing regional jets are at least 45 percent higher. Let's jump right into the Nepal accident. From the final report on 15 January 2023, an ATR 72-500 registration 9 November Alpha November Charlie operated by Yeti Airlines was operating a scheduled flight from Tribuven International Airport to Pokhara International Airport. This was the flight crew's third sector of the day and they had been operating shuttle flights between Kathmandu and Pokhara. There were 68 passengers and four crew on board for a total of 72 occupants, all who were fatally injured. The most probable cause of the accident is determined to be the inadvertent movement of both condition levers to the feather position in flight, which resulted in feathering of both propellers and subsequent loss of thrust, leading to an aerodynamic stall and collision with terrain. The contributing factors to the accident are, one, high workload due to operating into a new airport with surrounding terrain, which resulted in the crew missing indications that the propellers had feathered. Two, human factors issues such as high workload and stress that appeared to have resulted in the misidentification and selection of the propellers to the feathered position. Three, the proximity of terrain requiring a tight circuit to land on runway one, two. This type pattern also meant that the approach did not meet the stabilized visual approach criteria. Four, the use of visual approach circuit for runway one, two without any evaluation, validation, and resolution of its threats, which are highlighted by the SRM team of CAN. SRM is a safety monitoring process, and CAN is a regulatory authority of Nepal. Five, the lack of appropriate technical and skill-based training to the crew for the safe operation of the flight into a new and complex airport for the visual approach to runway 12. The airport itself is surrounded by terrain with the visual approach to 12 requiring relatively aggressive maneuvering at low altitude. Pokhar had recently opened a new airport and transitioned operations from the old airport into the new airport. Number six, non-compliance with SOPs, ineffective CRM, and lack of sterile cockpit discipline. This last part was largely understood to be a result of the accident flight being a training flight where a new captain the applicant was being checked out by a check pilot. The flight was operated by two captains. One captain was in the process of obtaining aerodrome familiarization for operating into VNPR. That's a designation for Pokhara. And the other captain was an instructor pilot, like I just said. The captain, being familiarized, who was occupying the left-hand seat was a pilot flying, and the instructor pilot occupying the right-hand seat was a pilot monitoring. The PM had made two landings at runway 12, one from the left-hand seat and the other from the right-hand seat. The flight was the first for the PF, who was occupying the left-hand seat. Previous experience, type of flight and seating position, etc. may have affected the situational awareness at the critical phase of the flight. The PF disengaged the autopilot system at an altitude of 721 feet above ground level. The PF then called for flaps 30 at 10.56 and 32 seconds, and the PM replied, flaps 30 and continued descent. The flight data recorder did not record any flap service movement at this time. Instead, the propeller rotation speed of both engines decreased simultaneously to less than 25% and the torque started decreasing to zero. Once the NP of the propeller decreases below 25%, no valid data is recorded in the FDR. Yet this condition is consistent with both propellers going into the feathered condition. The feathered condition is not recorded in the FDR parameter, like we said, so this particular fact is implied. On the cockpit voice record area microphone, a single master caution chime was recorded. The flight crew then carried out the before landing checklist without identifying the flaps were not in the 30-degree position before starting the left turn onto the base leg. 
During that time, the power lever angle increased from 41% to 44%. At that point, NP of both propellers was recorded as non-computed data in the FDR and the torque of both engines was at 0%. When the propellers are in feather, they don't produce thrust regardless of power lever angle. Prior to initiating commercial operations in the PHR, airlines were required to perform obligatory demonstration flights overseen by CAN. A few airlines noted that the approach and landing on runway 12 were difficult and not advisable. Nevertheless, Yeti Airlines utilize runway 30 for landing and runway 12 for departure during their demonstration flight. This would have been with the regulators. So the likely cause here was a distracted instructor pilot who was acting as a pilot monitoring and whose duties included extending the flaps when directed to do so by the pilot flying that this instructor pilot inadvertently selected the props to feather instead of selecting flaps 30. Now to do this, he had to inadvertently have grabbed the two handles just next to the flap handle, lifted the restraining handles on them, and pulled them aft. The condition levers control fuel flow to the engines, and it has a stop that will feather the propellers prior to shutting the engines down. Given the unstable nature of the normal approach to runway 12, the power levers were nearly idle when this occurred. So what would have otherwise been a rapid loss of thrust that the pilots would have felt instead went unnoticed. As the glide path began to get too low, the trainee captain attempted to increase thrust, but the fuel system will not increase engine RPM with the props feathered. In other words, as is somewhat common with modern aircraft, pilots don't demand power from the engines when they increase the power levers, they request it from the computer that manages fuel delivery. The power levers move freely, the engines just don't spool up. They were still turning towards a runway as this occurred and at a very low altitude. Ultimately, there was not enough time for them to sort out what had happened. They got slow and spun into a ravine. I'm not sure how much this crash has to do with the one in Brazil. Some folks in the comments section wondered if feathering the props had contributed to that accident, but it doesn't seem very likely. They wouldn't have been touching the flaps or the condition levers while in cruise at 17,000 feet, which is where they were right before they lost control. And a loss of power at 17,000 feet is much easier for pilots to handle than one at 400 feet. There is little threat to lowering the nose and trading altitude for airspeed when you're three miles high. At 400 feet, you're staring at the ground. Again, per the final report, the center pedestal design of the ATR 72-500 does not directly preclude an inadvertent movement of the propeller condition levers in lieu of the flap handle or vice versa, but some design considerations mitigate this risk. In order to move the propeller condition lever, the pilot must first activate a trigger below the lever to disengage the lever from a detent. Similarly, the flap handle also has detents, but there is no trigger. The entire flap handle is raised to lift the lever out of the detent. Additionally, the shape of each lever is different. Added to this, there are two for condition levers and only one for the flaps. The colors are different and their locations on the pedestal also differ. The flap handle is shaped like an airfoil, the propeller condition levers have ridged knobs, the thrust levers are smooth and cylindrical, and the landing gear handle is shaped like a wheel. These are all industry standard design considerations. Consideration had been given by the investigation to the alignment of the flap handles in the 15 degree position, which is geometrically close to the condition lever auto position. Given the previous design features, therefore, one has to consider other inputs such as workload, confirmation bias, and the operational context that contributed to the pilot monitoring actions. The CVR transcript indicated that there was likely a chime that followed the feathering of both propellers. This would have been a master caution chime. Considering ATR 72 systems failures resulting from NP drop due to feathering in flight, this was likely an electrical, anti-icing, or hydraulic system caution. The CVR transcript also highlighted that the crew was making configuration changes prior to landing well below 1,000 feet, which could contribute to the increased crew workload. Ultimately, the cause of the Volpass crash in Brazil will likely be due to a unique set of circumstances, but I think to the degree that it mirrors any other incident, it'll be the Eagle crash 30 years ago. As I said, we'll get into that in a future video. Thank you for watching. God bless the passengers and their family members, and we'll see you next time.